Thank you all. Good morning, everyone. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. As we continue through the book of Colossians. Colossians, chapter 1. As we pointed out last week, as we did an introduction to the book and greeting of Paul's, if you weren't here, you need to get caught up. It's, it's online for you to listen to, or if you even want to watch us, you can watch the, the teaching. But uh, Paul has received a visitor. Paul is incarcerated in Rome still. <laughs> and he has received a visitor by a man, a lovely man, by the name of Epaphras and who planted the church at Colossae and now needed to share with Paul uh, some concerns that he had for the city, really, at this point, very concerned of what was going through the city. Uh, There was a a danger of this hybrid type of uh, false teaching that was coming through the city. It was a mixture of Jewish legalism, Greek philosophy, and religious humanism. Oh, My things haven't changed, have they? But everything is repackaged even today. But Paul, hearing this, as we said, began to pick up his pen, his quill, we could say. And he began to write a letter to a church, listen, as a preventive measure. This is a letter, a preventive letter, not a corrective letter. It's a preventive letter. And he begins to write this preventive letter and keeping the church door guarded and keeping it closed to the dangers of the heresy that is working its way through this city, through the merchants that are bringing it from other lands. There was a main road going through the the city of Colossae. And so Paul picks up his pen and he begins to uh, write this letter of them and just encouraging them of who they are in Christ uh, to have them to combat this... uh, this false teaching that is trying to infiltrate the church there at Colossae and to know who they are in Christ and to really encourage them in living the Christian life uh, that they uh, will walk with the Lord and really keeping the main thing the main thing as Corson would say and what's the main thing is Jesus Christ and, and him crucified. Guys, if you keep Jesus Christ and him crucified always in the forefront of your life, You will always be able to know when something sounds weird, it probably is weird. If something sounds weird, it probably is weird. If something smells, it probably is because the basis of that smell is to smell. I don't even know if that made sense, but I just threw that one out. I'm glad I didn't step in it. But there are a lot of people that step in it and get it on themselves. And try to live through it. And there's a stench of false teaching, misguided direction. And we've got to be careful with that. Paul wants to remind the church at Colossae. He wants to encourage them. And wants to remind them that they are in Christ. And that's powerful. And as we shared last week, with that knowledge and understanding, listen, you are complete. Amen? You are complete in Christ. Stop looking for other things. Stop trying to shop around for other things that you think may complete you. Christ is enough. Christ will complete you. Listen, you have 66 books to read. That's enough. (laughs) Now, I'm not going against books, and, you know, uh, I have plenty myself. But as I said last, last week... Why was this book read? What is the author's intent? And what's the biblical undergirding to this book? And you've got to ask yourself this question. I didn't mention this at the first service, but last service I said, Satan has infiltrated the bookstores, the Christian bookstores. He hasn't infiltrated the sanctuary. It's God's church. But he's infiltrated the bookstores. So you've got to be very careful, guys, of what you're picking up and what you're reading. Christ is got to be the center of your heart. He completes you. So if you're thinking, I just need something else, I, 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 hey, get into the Word of God. You got 66 books to tell you and to remind you who you are in Christ. We pick up our study 
again back in chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. But let's back up all the way to verse 1 and just get a running start. By the way, verse 3 through 8 is our verses. In the Greek, (laughs) I read this, it's one sentence. Can you imagine that? And we got to break it down, and we will, by God's grace and the Holy Spirit's help. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we go. We pick it up in verse 3. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. We'll stop there this morning, and we'll pray and ask God to bless our study. So, Father, Lord, we ask to you for you to speak to us this morning, God. We ask and we've come, Lord, as Matt said, panting after the water brook. We've come hungry, God. We've come, uh, Lord Jesus, just wanting to hear a word that we can take home with us uh, today and live it out through this week. Speak to us, God. Bless these, your people, Lord. Give them ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. We ask it in Jesus' name. The church said, amen. Amen. So what we're going to do in verses 3 through 8 is we're going to see really Paul's gratitude, Paul's, uh, you know, his thankfulness, his appreciation, his recognition toward the church. Hey, and their steadfastness in keeping the faith. And, and it's, always, it's always important. You know, we who are uh, respectfully are a little bit more mature, let's say, we, 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 we've been in the word of God, we've been walking with the Lord for a while, we cannot ourselves stop be understanding that we're disciples as well. We still need to be encouraging and encouraging one another. Hey, hang in there, man. Hey, did you hear this verse? You know, we need to continually be educated, if I may say, uh, by the word of God. We need to continue to be encouraging with one another. Uh, you know, it doesn't long, matter how long we've been walking with the Lord, whether it's one week, you got saved last week, or it's, you know, many years. Uh, let's not ever think that we made it. Let's not ever think that, that there's another level for us, in a sense, to be above all everyone else. And this is what the philosophy was floating around in that city of Colossae. And it's very, as we said last week, it's, it's alluring. You know, uh, it's, you know, being told that you can uh, be more knowledgeable. It works on our pride. It works on our, you know, our minds. Oh, I can learn more. I can go higher. Yeah, be careful with that. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, the Bible says. He will lift you up. I'd rather God lift me up. I'd rather God help me up, really, uh, than than some philosophy and some understanding that I, I can make it. You know, that, I, that I'm, I've arrived, you know. That's, that's Eastern philosophy. That's, 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 that's weirdness, okay? And so Paul here, he begins by really, and, and he should, being grateful to God. He, he starts out by being, he says, we give thanks to God. I like that. Timothy and myself, the team here at, at, at Rome, uh, we, we just are continually giving thanks uh, uh, having this attitude of gratitude. And, and first and foremost, and I love how Paul does, the primacy for his gratitude first is to God. Notice that? And the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, there is so much, so much, isn't there, to be thankful to God. Amen? Amen. There is, man. And, and here is Paul in a Roman prison, locked up, as we've shared with you in Philippians, and yet he has something to be thankful for, you know. He has something to be grateful for. 
He's receiving visitors of the faith who are encouraging him. Maybe men and, 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 and you know, we don't know who, who's visited him, but, but people have come to visit him to encourage him. And maybe these people he would have never met before in his life. So he sees his imprisonment as a place of, of, of prayer, of writing letters, and also uh, in writing the letters that he can encourage. But he's first gr- grateful for the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grateful for him sending his only begotten son, Jesus, God incarnate. His name means God is salvation. Right there, just in that name, there's uh, uh, greatness. The one which separates uh, from all other names. There is no other name. There is no other name. Uh, he is the name above all names. He is the one who's, who is separate from all other names names. His name is great. His name is salvation, who came to earth to be the Christ, and that means the Messiah, to fulfill all of the Old Testament prophecies concerning his first advent, concerning the Messiah coming. Uh, Jesus claimed himself to be Messiah. Let me take you back to the book of John. Let me take you back to that well where the woman was there to meet Jesus. What a, what a divine appointment, Amen. But it was there when the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said in verse 26 of John 4, I who speak to you, what? Am he. I who speak to you, am he. There are people who say, Jesus never claimed to be Messiah. Jesus never claimed to be God. They're not reading the Bible. But you read the Bible. And you know that's that to be true. He did claim himself to be God. He claimed himself to be Messiah right here. He is the Savior, the one who saves us and is our Lord, Paul says. Is he our Lord? Is he your Lord, Kurios? Is he your master? Is he the one of whom you yield to, whom you belong to, and who has control of your life? That's what that word Lord means. When we say Jesus Christ, Lord, that's not his first name, middle name, and last name. That's who he is, that he he is to be in our life. Our Lord and no other Lord. Our Lord and no other Lord stepped out of eternity to be born of the Virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit, who was prophesied and became Emmanuel. Right there, God speaks of his deity, with us speaks of his humanity. Our Lord went about going, doing good and being charged because of that good. And because of that, he was nailed to a cross and died an atoning death for our sins. That's our Lord. Our Lord, who was buried after three days, he rose from the grave, overcoming death and freeing all who call upon him from the guilt and shame and the fear of the grave. Our Lord, who ascended back to his Father, where he sits at the right hand, making intercession for us. He's praying for us right now. Lord, we need it. Pray for California, too. They've been charged that any church opens today will, will, be, will be charged with contempt of court. He's praying for us. He's interceding for us. And our Lord is coming back. First for his church and then with his church to rule and reign in the world. If he came the first time, friends, he will keep his promise that he is coming again. Now that's something to be thankful for. Amen. Amen. That's something to be thankful for. Praying always, he says. Paul says we pray for the churches without intermission. We pray without intermission. We pray literally around you, he says. As we first give thanks to our God, we are praying on your behalf. And the habit of constant prayer is a wonderful blessing and gift and and honor it should be for us to do. To be constantly in that prayer mode because we are in Christ and we can communicate with God, and we can worship and, and bring supplication for ourselves, yes, but the exciting part of it is that we can intercede for others and friends. I've seen the power of intercession, amen. I've seen the power of praying for you guys and your personal prayers for your personal lives and personal things that we're going through, and all of us who have gone through this season since March and praying and, and seeing God move, not only in our church, but in your personal lives. 
Paul says, we're surrounding you, man. Without intermission, we're surrounding you with prayer, and we're giving thanks to our God. The next thing he's grateful for is their faith, or for faith, however you want to put it. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, for your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. I love this. He mentions three things that makes Paul's heart merry. Three things, three things that, that it, again, Epaphras has come. Epaphras has shared with him of the church. Epaphras has told him what is going on in the church. I love it when we gather as pastors. As, as pastors, we gather in Fredericksburg. Uh, by the way, be praying. We're going to host the Fredericksburg pastors, all who want to come. Your church, you guys, we're going to host them. We're going to have a dinner for them and, and just be able to get, to get to know one another even more. But also when the Calvary Chapel guys come and their wives or when we gather with Calvary Chapel pastors, what a blessing it is to share after we cry on each other's shoulder. But you guys are so good, I don't need to be crying, man. But we share with you, what's going on in your church? Wow, man. Hey, one person got saved Sunday. Praise the Lord. You know, hey, we got in a building project. Oh, God bless you. We'll be praying hard for you. But, you know, it's just an honor and a blessing. And here, this, this, this pastor, this church planter, Epaphras, has been sharing with Paul the faith and the hope and the love that he sees these Christian virtues, these essential virtues, these essential qualities that need to be in the church and of the people. Birthed out and worked out of a heart that has been renewed in Christ. Faith, hope, Love. I mean, Paul spoke of that in 1 Corinthians 13, didn't he? Three things will abide. Three things will last. Three things. Faith, and that's faith in Jesus. Hope, hope of our heavenly inheritance. And love. And love for the saints. You've heard this before. Even psychiatrists have said this. And sociologists have said this. If you bring home a brand new baby and you just love that child and you speak into that child and you hold it and love it and, and discipline it, that child and, and love it back after you spank. Anyway, but um, man, the child's going to grow up just with, with just great qualities of knowing that they're loved and cared for. And, and that they're special, and that when they do go a, a, a wrong, that they will be corrected, not given a trophy, but corrected. Anyway, let me go on. But these three things, he says, will last, but the greatest of these is love. Because when our, when our, uh, when our faith you know, is complete, when we no longer walk by faith but by sight, when our hope has come to pass, when we're now in the heavenly presence with our Savior, the one thing that will always last, the greatest of these, is love. And isn't it true that love covers what? A multitude of sins. Church, you're taught well here. You understand that. that we forget that, though, don't we? That love covers a multitude of sins sometimes. And it's just wonderful. So, so Paul says, says, you know, since we, the team, t- me and Timothy, have heard of your faith in, in Christ Jesus, you know, he, he says he's just so grateful. Now, again, he says we heard of your faith. Okay? Again, Epaphras is sharing this. Paul has never visited Colossae because Paul didn't plant the church there. But hold on, as we shared last week, it was out of Paul's, uh, it was the fruit out of the church that Paul did plant. And that was where? In Ephesus, that was in Ephesus, and as that church was growing, Paul spent two to three years there, just equipping the saints, growing them, you know, loving upon them. You know, fruit began, of course, to to show. And Epaphras, as we said, felt like I, I want to go to Colossae and I want to take what we have here there. And and first and foremost, that's the gospel, right? So he says, "Hey, I heard of your faith in Christ Jesus." He says, the word faith, of course, means a conviction of the truth that one can trust in. What this faith is not is a leap in the dark. 
Okay, it's, it's, it's not a leap in the dark. Faith is based on fact and evidence to its object. And this saving faith that Paul is speaking of has its object of faith based upon the biblical and historical, historical fact and evidence in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus is the object of our faith. Christ is the object of our faith. And from this faith, Flows love. Christ is the object of our faith. And what this false teaching was coming across, the city of Colossae was saying not only was it bringing legalism or a type of, uh, of Judaism along with philosophy and, and all kinds of other weird things, but they were also, well, and, and Christ also. Of course, we're Christians, but we're Christians that are more complete than you are, and that's a lie. Now, our faith of object, our, our object of our faith is only in Christ, and from that flows love. Notice, and he says, and of your agape love, that agape love, that unconditional love for all the saints. Faith in God and love for other believers always go together. Always will go together. 1 John 3.23 says, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, faith, and love, and love one another as he gave us the commandment. Faith always goes together with love. Love and faith. One of the visible results of our faith, guys, is love for, for one another. The world will, will know us by our what? By our love as Christians. And that's what Paul is hearing of this church. And it just blesses his heart. He, he's so blessed by their faith, by their hope, by their love. And because of this love, again, you have the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. That, that uh, confident expectation, that word means for hope. That confident expectation that there's more than this abundant life that Christ has given to us now. He's given us a wonderful life upon this earth. He's given us a mission, a direction. He's given us gifts of the Spirit. He's, he's, he's taken our talents, and as we make him Lord, we, we take our talents, our natural talents, and we lay it at his feet for him to use. But there is more than this on earth. We must be reminded of that. You know that verse. We know it well in 1 Corinthians 15. In Christ we have hope in this life only. We are all people most to be pitied. If this is all it is, he says, Paul says it, man. We are are most to be pitied. This isn't all it is. And that is what builds our faith. That was bring joy to us. We're having a great time on this earth. We're, we're experiencing God. We're walking with him. We're loving him. We're worshiping him. We're touching others. We're, 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 we're meeting. We're gathering. We're being obedient this morning. But there's more to our faith than this. Because our faith, Paul says, is laid up. That means reserved, kept secure in heaven, our heavenly inheritance. I like how Peter says it. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Isn't that cool? It's a great verse to read when you're going through it on this earth. When when all things seem to be just going haywire, to to read what Peter has to say and said, okay, all right got the hope okay all right god i'm ready to move forward again you know because sometimes we, we we lose we lose it man you know uh, the new you know new word uh, in, in the family i said man stop going COVID on me man what's wrong with you and sometimes we just lose it right and and we got to get back to that hope another thing that paul is great of course is grateful for is the gospel he says that of which you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel he says, 
which has come to you. I love that. The gospel, he says, of which you heard before. The gospel must be heard. The gospel must be heard, guys. What if he didn't go to Colossae? What if Epaphras wasn't obedient to go out? Just to go out to the streets of Ephesus. And that was a mess. And, 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 and to proclaim it. But here he says, which you heard before the hope that is laid up for them in heaven. And, and the word of truth, the Bible, the resource of our faith. The object of our faith is Jesus Christ. The resource of our faith is the word of God. Not one's own thoughts or philosophy or religious literature, but the Bible. And what Bible did they have then? They had the Old Testament. And from the Old Testament, they were able to preach the gospel. They had the evidence. They had the evidence of Calvary. They had, was still fresh in the minds of the people as they're hearing what took place there in Jerusalem. And as Paul himself is writing the Bible, Colossians. And it, 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 it worked upon the heart of this minister to go out and to speak forth, to herald, to herald the gospel, the resource of our faith, the good news, not good views. There's a lot of good views, and people want to bring their views, don't they? Well, well let me tell you my view. Well, no. Let me tell you the good news. Not the fake news, the good news, man. Oh, well, I got good views. Well, you, oh, that's fine. It works for you, but not going to get you anywhere. We have the good news. And this good news is a promise of salvation, and it needs to be heard. You know the old saying, how will they hear unless, what? If someone is sent, a preacher is sent, and, and, and Paul writes that out, and so it's a wonderful I was going to bring that in, but anyway, it's true. But a gospel must be proclaimed. Notice verse 6, which has come to you. That's personal. And Paul's saying, guys, let's remember back when Epaphras came to you. He came to you to proclaim the gospel. He says it's not only come to you personally, as it has also in all the world. That's universal. In all the world, now, of course, that's the Roman world at this point. That's the Mediterranean world. He's not speaking of, of the world that we know today. A lot of that was still trying to be discovered. But the world that they knew, the Roman world, we could say, it has gone to you so far at this point, universal, which you heard, the gospel, the gospel must be proclaimed. The gospel must go out. The gospel must be proclaimed in order for the lost to be found. And in proclamation, then it's upon the hearer to respond to it. And in response, we start to see then a life being changed and fruit being uh, coming about. We'll get that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. So we are, have been saved, guys. We have been saved, and we have been now called uh, fishermen. Uh, we have been women, too. We've been called farmers. We've been called gardeners. Gardeners, Paul here is kind of making, a, a, you know, a, 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 a theme here uh, on farming, on gardening, and spreading seed among soil of man's hearts. We we got to go out, as Jesus said, and, and, and spread spread the good news, spread the word of God, proclaim the gospel, you know. And yes, it's going to fall on different hearts and different soils. That's, that's, that's not, our job is, is to proclaim. Our job is to herald. Our job is to bring the truth. And then we leave it to the Holy Spirit and the person who has received it. You know, don't, don't, don't get caught up in that. Don't, you know, of course we want people to come to Christ. And of course we want them to say yes. And then when they do say yes, we, we, we stutter. What? I mean, uh, 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 okay, oh, they didn't tell me that. Let me see. You know, it's a blessing. It's, it's, it's great, man. It's beautiful. But, but we have been saved. We, we have been saved to proclaim to those who have ears to hear. It's, part, it, it, it's our part commanded by Jesus who, who spoke of the great commission, not the great suggestion. 
Get your Bibles and turn to Mark 16. Go left to Mark 16. It's the last chapter in the book of Mark. And it's in red, so it tells me that Jesus said this. In Mark 16, 16, that's always, or 15, Mark 16, 15. It says, and he said to them, that's Jesus, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That's the command. That's Christ's proclamation. To go further, go now more left to Matthew 28. Turn it over to Matthew 28, verse 18. Again, we're familiar with this, but it's good to review. Matthew 28, 18, the way Matthew writes it. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's a Bible study right there, but let's move on. 19, go. There's another go in the Bible. Therefore, because of this authority given to me, now I command you to go and make disciples of some nations. Of all nations. Look up that word nation later. It's ethnos. It's all, everybody. Not just a certain group. Not just a, a certain race or a certain you know, pedigree. All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We have the Trinity there. Teaching, here it is, them to observe all things that I have commanded and lo... I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And everybody said, amen. Isn't that great? Get back to Colossians now. So that's the great commission, not the great suggestion. And you do it your way. You have the truth. You have the word. You have the Bible. You have the gospel. You have the purpose. You have the commandment. But, but do it your way. A lot of people say, no, you've got to do it this way. No, this is the way you do it. Suck lemons. And then go out and reach people. No. I see people on, uh, uh, standing up on a box. Some do it well. Some don't do it so well. I see people just going downtown and, and handing a, a track and, and wanting to engage in conversation. Some people want to engage. Some people don't. That's fine. At least they got the track. Even though you see it later on on the floor. Just pick it up and give it away again. Other people, do it how you've been called to do it. The Gideons do it a great way, but that's the Gideon way. You do it how you've been called, but the bottom line is what? Do it. There you go, just like Nike. Do it. The gospel, he, 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 the gospel has to be heard, has to be proclaimed, and it has to produce fruit. The gospel should produce fruit. He says, and is, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. The NLT says it this way. The NLT says it's, it is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it has changed your life. I like that. As he's getting a report back from Epaphras, Paul knows, wow, not only was the gospel proclaimed, not only was the gospel heard, the gospel, they responded to it, and fruit is abounding in the church, guys. The gospel is like a seed, right? And this is a great lesson to teach our kids and ourselves. When you see a seed, you know, this is a jalapeno. No, that's not a jalapeno. It's a jalap, but it must die first. It must be buried and in order to be to come up in its fruit. And you know that, that whole discourse of burying, of being buried, of, of, of dying to self. Uh, in baptism, we, we go down in the waters as a symbol of death, and we come up now of who we are in Christ, right? And it's a whole symbol. It's a great, beautiful thing that God has commanded us to do. 
But the gospel is like a seed when buried in the sincere heart of man, it will bear fruit. Now notice I said the sincere heart of man. You know, people who really want to get saved and and respond to Christ. And no, we may not know everything. None of us did. But that's where discipleship comes in. That's where follow-up comes in. But here, it's planted and it is rooted in grace. Not works, not anything external that a man can try to achieve, but it's an internal work, amen? It's an eternal work that only God by the Holy Spirit can do through the grace of his son Jesus. That seed of truth brings forth spiritual growth. We should be seeing spiritual growth in our lives. We should be, we should be hunger for spiritual growth. We should, we should be at the Bible studies and, the, and, and, and we should be in our personal Bible study. We should want to grow spiritually in our prayer life so then we can get to that point of interceding for others as well. We should want to start changing these, these habits that we've had so long and all of a sudden we're convicted by them. Well, listen to your conviction and then follow through on it. You got the Holy Spirit as a helper. What else do we need? I mean, it's just great. It's awesome. Well, moving on, Paul is grateful for faithful ministers as we wrap this up, or, or the faithful minister, however you want to see it. Uh, he says in verse 7, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. I love that. The name Epaphras means, get, it, get this, lovely. His name means lovely. Look it up later. Epaphras, lovely. Uh, that's a great name, you know, uh, uh, for, for a man who's living it out. A man who, who felt called to go to an unknown city and who knew what was going to take place but God, but being faithful to go and proclaim the gospel. People were getting saved. He had to get a house to open up, Philemon's house, to start bringing people in so they can get discipled, they can have a church service, they, they can break out in homes and, and they can, small groups, and you know, it just, who knew? But his faith to go out. Oh, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring what? Good news. And he's living out his name, man. Hey, lovely. What's up, Holmes? Pastor Lovely. Can I speak with you? Yeah, hold on, man. Hold on a minute. It was he who brought the gospel to Colossae. It was he who discipled them and equipped them for ministry, who married and buried them. It was he who was so faithful to God and to the church, and it is he who was concerned for their spiritual well-being, and he should be concerned. As a shepherd is concerned for the sheep, the wolves were coming through the city, and he was trying to protect them as he should. Paul goes on to speak of their pastor, of their minister, of their church planter. He says he is our dear fellow servant. Sundulos is that word, servant there. One who serves the same master with another. No contention, no jealousy. Well, you planted that church in Ephesus. That's 100 miles away, brother. Don't you know the rule? We all get caught up that way. Don't you know you're not supposed to plant a church uh, closer than 100 miles away? <laughs> we, I, I'm guilty of that sometimes. But here is a faithful guy. Hey, Paul, we serve the same Lord. We, we serve the same God, man. He's a humble team player, listen, with no ambition other than to lift up Jesus and see others come to Christ as Savior. Pastor Lovely, he says, who is a faithful minister. Now, he uses a different word from servant, although it's in the same family. It's diakonos. He says, who is a faithful minister, not a monster, not a menace, not a threat to the body of Christ, not a rancher herding sheep like cattle. No, he's a faithful minister, a diakonos. And that of Christ 
on your behalf, he says. A minister who serves others. A table waiter. You know that word. Where we get our word deacon. And everybody wants to be a deacon until they're treated like one. Hey, deacon, can you get that trash over there? And can you change these water? There's, there's, there's these uh, evaporators over here. Can you? Well, I'm a deacon, man. What are you talking about, Holmes? Yeah. Table waiter. Slave. Servant. <laughs> We all want to be called pastor until we have to, until we're treated like one, right? Paul, with the most enduring words, calls Epaphras a servant leader. That's what he's saying. He said, "Guys, you had a great, you have a great servant leader who cares so much for you that he's come to me." And I uh, check out. I can't remember how many miles it is from Colossae to Rome, but I think it's about a thousand miles. He traveled a thousand miles, probably some are nautical miles, maybe by boat, because he was so concerned for the church. He loved them so much, and he wanted them to continue the way they started. And he says, who also declare to us your love in the Spirit. You see, friends, when, I, when, when a church is led, is led with ministry leaders and pastors and servants and elders who have the shepherd's heart, who cares so much, who has the shepherd's heart of mission, of the great commission, not suggestion, leadership in the body who, who care who are truly called to be leaders, when you have that, the body will begin to bear fruit. The body will begin to bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit begins with what? Love. And you'll start seeing that. And I love it when people visit and they say, man, there's a lot of love here in this church. Man, that just blesses me. Because that's what we want here at Calvary. We, we want to have uh, 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 an abundance of fruit of the Spirit here, and especially love. Love for one another, right? Starts in the home, starts in, in the house of God, and love for others, love for the lost, that we want to see them come to Christ, love for those who are hungry and thirsty after righteousness, and we want to equip them. And Paul's saying, Colossae, you have got a, you have got a blessed servant, man, and I'm so grateful for the minister, Epaphras. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God. Thank you for what you're doing here at our church, God. Your church, but where we gather here, God. Thank you what you're doing with the, with the folks here. And, and thank you for vision and direction. Thank you, God, for allowing us as leadership even to pause and wait and, and hold off and, and let's make sure and, and let's call upon the Spirit and, and let's see what God wants and and then, and then move, Lord God, and, and, and thank you for that. And, and Lord, we, we, we ask, Lord, to continue to speak to us and, and continue to speak through us, God. That, that, that we don't become lethargic, that we don't become lukewarm, God. And I believe, God, that no doubt this, this, um, these things that have taken place in the last four or five months have really woken up the church and, and really uh, got us to... Uh, to uh, think upon our walk and, and, and personally and then corporately the church and, and how we're doing things. Because we want to glorify you, God. There's no celebrities here. You're, you're our Lord. You're our God. You're our Savior. So thank you for that. And maybe there are some here today who have never given their life to Jesus Christ. I would be remiss by speaking of proclaiming the gospel and and speaking of, uh, of uh, giving opportunity for the lost to get saved. And, and maybe you're here and you're lost. You're here, you don't know Christ. Or maybe you've just been playing religion without relationship. In other words, you're in charge of yourself. In other words, uh, every other Sunday or a few, or a few Wednesday nights, you'll be seen but other than that you're in charge of your own life if that's you 
you need to come to Christ. You need to have that hope of eternal life, the, the hope of when you take your last breath on earth that you will take your first in heaven. The hope that as you walk by faith on, here, on earth that you will walk by sight in heaven seeing Jesus Christ and calling him Lord and he telling you, well done. Now, if you don't have that assurance right now, if, you, if you're not hopeful for that, if, if that's something that you know that's not in your life, then you need to give your life right now to Jesus Christ and you can do it right where you're at. As you call upon the Lord, as you, as you admit that you're a sinner, Lord, I'm a sinner. Just say that, Lord, I'm a sinner. If that's anyone here, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm lost and I'm in need of a savior. And the gospel that was shared today, Lord, through this teaching, the hope that we have in you, I want, God, come into my life, forgive me. Thank you for dying on that cross for my sin. Overcoming the grave, death and decay, giving me hope of the resurrection to come. I receive you as Lord and Savior today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, we have a, a Bible for you right out there on that table. And we want you to take one, please, because there's a lot of great uh, answers to your questions. It's a great little Bible. It's, it's, uh, it's not a...